Leah, the founder of Broadstairs Consulting. We're a board advisory and mediation practice, helping people thrive and flourish in crisis situations. Believe in crisis isn't an if, it's a when. We want to help people disagree well and move forwards in challenging times. While we are unafraid of crisis, it's rare for one to be resolved in a single day. However long the day or night that gave rise to the crisis in the first place, there's always something we can learn. That's the genesis of the longest day. Our guests have overcome a litany of crises. Many have worked with us in some capacity in the past. All of them have stories worth hearing. We trust them to make this worth your while. We hope it helps you trust us. Today's guest is Sir Stephen Timms, who has been the Member of Parliament for East Ham since 1994. He is also the Labour Party's Faith Envoy. He was the Shadow Minister for Employment from 2010 until September 2015, and previously sat on the Exiting the European Union Select Committee. He currently chairs the Work and Pensions Select Committee, and is also the Prime Minister's Trade Envoy to Switzerland and Liechtenstein. Stephen held a number of ministerial posts under the previous Labour government, including Chief Secretary and Financial Secretary to the Treasury. Before entering Parliament, Stephen worked in the telecommunications industry for 15 years, first for Logica and then for Ovum, where he managed its telecommunications report business until he became an MP. Stephen is also a member of the Ramblers Association and the former chair of Christians on the Left. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us on The Longest Day. Thank you. Perhaps you might like to tell our listeners about your longest day. Well, the event which I suppose comes to mind is the occasion in May 2010 when I was stabbed uh, just after the 2010 general election, stabbed by one of my constituents in my constituency surgery. Uh, She'd made an appointment to come and talk to me and said she wanted to talk about an employment matter. Um, But what she actually wanted to do was to stab me, and she did stab me three times um, until she was mercifully stopped by my then assistant. But that was a a difficult difficult day and a quite difficult aftermath to it as well. How long was it between the event taking place and you being able to, I suppose, accept the experience and, and determine how you wanted to move forwards? Mm. Well, it was it was a few days before I was out of hospital. I was rushed to hospital on the, uh, the day. The health service the paramedics attended very, very quickly, thankfully. And the Royal London Hospital was able to patch me up um, and I was out of hospital, I suppose, four or five days after that. I didn't get back to work until late June, so that took a month plus. But, you know, once once I was home and out of hospital, I, I was able to think about what had happened, um, take take a view about it, and perhaps begin to think about what my response to the event and to my assailant ought to be. And something that I've often been asked about is whether I have forgiven uh, the person who stabbed me. And my answer has been that I think forgiveness requires some personal communication. I, I don't think I can sort of stand and announce to the world, I have forgiven my assailant without some communication with her. And I've always hoped that there might be such communication. I don't think I bear her any ill will. I'm now fine. There's no lasting ill effects. I don't have flashbacks about what happened. uh, So I don't have to think about the event very much at all. But I, I think forgiveness involves more than just not having malice. I think there needs to be some communication, and so far there hasn't been. One of the things that came out in the media coverage at the time was how unthinkable that this could happen to an elected individual. Is there anything that 
I suppose, helped you to be able to go through that experience, um, either from your career or from your personal life? Mm. I mean, I I wasn't the first MP who'd been uh, attacked. The case of Nigel Jones had happened a few years before that. Somebody died in that case, not Nigel himself, but somebody who'd been working with him. And so it wasn't a completely unknown experience at the time. And of course, since then, there have been a number of such incidents um, with much worse outcomes than, than mine. I was sitting at that surgery behind a quite big desk. And in a way, that was quite a good way of organising, I think, um, but the problem was it was the end desk in a row. And so my assailant was able just to walk around the, the side of the desk. She had her hand out. I thought she was coming to shake my hand. That was what I uh, thought, but that wasn't what she had in mind, it turned out. Um, she did say subsequently that she had two knives with her, a large one and a small one, and she decided at the last minute that she couldn't hide the large knife up her sleeve. So that was why she used the small one, which is probably the reason that I'm still here. Um, After that event, my assailant stabbed me three times. I was with an assistant called Andrew Baisley, who thankfully knew what to do to remove a knife from somebody involving grabbing hold of their thumb in a particular way. So he did that and and the stabbing stopped. Um, But thinking subsequently about that, we we have reorganised the way my surgery is laid out in a very sort of simple way so that I now sit in the middle table of three instead of the end table. We have somebody, one assistant sitting on either side of me. So if somebody came in with the same idea again, it would be it would be a bit harder now you know if we'd thought about all of that in advance maybe would have we would have thought that i shouldn't have been sitting in the end on the end desk but i think it's quite difficult to be prompted to think through such things until you, until it's actually happened there was one previous occasion i remember when somebody did attack me not not with a knife but um a rather unpleasant way. I, I wasn't hurt at all. Um, I, uh, on that occasion, I was just sitting on my own in a room with constituents coming in to see me. So we had tightened things up a bit since then. But with the benefit of hindsight, I can think of things that we could have done, which we have done since, that would have avoided uh, actually being stabbed, or at least made it a good deal harder to be stabbed. I mean, there's other things. The police were very, very helpful at the time. And when my surgeries restarted a month or so later, they offered me a knife arch so that anybody coming into the surgery would have to go through the knife arch on their way. But we just decided that was going to make the experience of going to see your MP such an unpleasant one that it wasn't worth doing, that we didn't take, take that up. And, you know, it's 13 years now since it happened. There haven't been any further unpleasant incidents. I hope the arrangements that are now in place are adequate. Obviously, you had to take some time off work. What did you learn about your team when you came back to work? Well, they did a great job, um, which I was extremely grateful for, um, keeping things going for the, the weeks that I was away. They were very thoughtful, actually, uh, which I was grateful for. And, uh, I, I, you know, there were lots of messages coming in and cards and, and so on in that period. Um, and the, the team picked out some of them to let me see and, you know, didn't deluge me with communications. Um, and so, you know, my recuperation was reasonably peaceful, I think, thanks to their uh, support. I did indicate at the time to the police that I would welcome the opportunity to speak to my assailant at some point, but they kind of took that away and then came back and said, well, I don't think that's a good idea, and, and nothing happened. But then years later, I 
did receive through, through via the police three letters which my assailants had written to me. And there were a sort of series of letters. The first one was quite sort of wooden and didn't say a great deal. The second one warmed up a bit. The third one was was much kind of warmer. And essentially these letters said sorry about what had happened. And the police asked if, having received those letters, I, and I talked to my wife about it as well, whether we would be interested in a process which could lead to meeting uh, Roshnara Chowdhury. And we, we said, yes, we would welcome that. And so a process began. For reasons that I don't really understand, it has stopped. It seems to have got stuck in some bureaucratic process in the Ministry of Justice, as far as I can tell. Um, they've apologised, but it, it hasn't got moving again. So at the moment, I don't see any, there's, there's, there's no sign of movement. I would have liked to have had that opportunity to meet before Roshnara Chowdhury leaves prison, which is likely to be um, in 2015. Um, she had a minimum term of 15 years, so that would be late 2025, sorry, 2025. There's no sign of that happening at the moment. Are you feeling stuck? Has conflict got you down? Have you considered mediation? Mediation is a confidential and flexible way to resolve conflicts. 86% of all mediations end in a solution, saving time, money, and stress for all involved. Thanet Mediation Centre, a Broadstairs consulting initiative, offers mediation services to individuals and organisations in Thanet, Kent, and further afield. For more information or advice, email us at info at broadstairsconsulting.com. We are here to help you move forwards. What do you think your team learned about you as you've gone through that experience, come back to work, en engaged with that, let me call it a fight, to pursue meeting your assailant face-to-face? -face. Mm. There's huge courage in that but but what kind of i suppose witness mm. well you need to ask them which which can be arranged um i i mean i don't i don't actually think there was a great deal of courage involved in my part i mean sometimes people have said that it was very brave coming back to work or going i i think perhaps going back to the surgery for the first time took a bit of courage because i was worried there might be somebody else there who's going to do the same thing um but of course there wasn't and there hasn't been in the 13 years since so that it, it didn't take very long to kind of get over that initial anxiety uh but it did take a bit but you know i think from from my point of view i i i enjoy my job um the last thing i would have wanted was to have stopped doing it because of what had happened uh, that would uh, for me have been a terrible defeat in every sense for the effect of the attack on me to have been that I stopped doing the job that I love doing. Um, so I don't think that did take very much courage to carry on doing what I've always enjoyed doing. I, I, I suppose, you know, if you do enjoy what you're doing, if you believe it is the right thing to do, then, you know, the, the, the motivation to to do it is is pretty strong, and um, I, I, I'm not sure it is really courage to overcome the suggest. I, I, it, it just did not cross my mind not to not to carry on. You know what? What I've done resigned. What, I might have been unemployed. What, you know, no, no, that was not an option that I uh, crossed my mind at all. <laughs> what did you learn about yourself? Well. Um, my wife told me she thought that, I think she said she felt I was less patient after what had happened than before. I mean, I'm not conscious of that, <laughs> but she may be right. Um, I I wasn't conscious, I don't think, of much change happening. But, it, you know, maybe if there were changes, they, they, they were changes that other people would notice more than more than me um i i think i 
carried on sort of plodding away in much the same way that I did before. It certainly made me significantly more famous than I'd been before, um, which is a mixed blessing, no doubt. But maybe, you know, in terms of what I learned about myself, maybe it was how much I enjoyed doing my job and wanted to carry on doing it. What do you say to people who work for and with you who haven't yet found that thing that brings you as much joy as being an MP? I, I think for a lot of people, there is enormous reward in work. Now, there are... There is work which doesn't bring very much reward other than, than than financial, but there are a lot of kinds of work which do. And I suppose that's one reason that I've always felt so strongly about the importance of people being able to be in, in work. Yes, there are financial benefits from it, but there are massive other benefits as well. I've just this morning been with a, a, a group called Resurgo, the Resurgo Trust, um, which I follow. They've been around for 20 years. I've followed them for the last 15, a church-based initiative around supporting unemployed youngsters into work. I think the way they set about their work, I mean, one of the points of the event that I was at with them this morning was just to showcase the data showing how effective their work has been compared with other comparable initiatives. And I think, well, what it shows in part is just how effective the churches that have run those initiatives, 15 of them, I think, from next year now, started initially in Hammersmith but spread since, um, how effective those churches have been in really nurturing young people, young people very often thinking there wasn't any future for them at all, and persuading them that there is a future and enabling them indeed to get into satisfying and rewarding work. Um, so I, I suppose what I'm saying to people is that you you will, you can find satisfaction, joy, in work, that's something to look forward to and and feel confident about and um, look for the help that can allow you to move in that direction. And if you were to do your career again, what is the one character trait you wish you had more of? Hmm. (laughs) Uh, I wish I knew more about economics. That probably isn't a character trait, but um, something I missed out on and often wish that I'd addressed. I suppose, oh, you know, if I was starting again, I, 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 I've never really had a plan. I think having a strategic view, a sense of where you want to get to and some of the steps required to get there, I think that would have been a a good additional and different character trait. Whether in the end it would have made much difference, I'm not sure, because from my point of view, things have have worked out well in in the absence of 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 a plan. But I've often felt that there ought to be a plan. Um, There never was. It would have been perhaps good to have had one. And if you had to live your longest day again... What food would you choose to fuel it? Food would I throw? Uh, I, well, I think the food which I consumed on that particular day was fine, which no doubt would have been a lunchtime sandwich, I think, because it was early afternoon when uh, the attack took place. What is uh, your sandwich of choice? Uh, it would have been something like a cheese salad sandwich, I should think, and a bowl of soup which was absolutely fine. I'll stick with that. That's great. Well, thank you for sharing your experiences with us. Thank you for um, telling us a little bit more about the people around you and about your own career and how much you love your job. Thank you for asking me. You've been 
been listening to a Broadstairs Consulting Limited podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. Tune in soon to hear the next installment of The Longest Day. Copyright 2023. Production copyright. Broadstairs Consulting Limited. All rights reserved. Thank you.